Frid och shalom, välkomna till 13 januari. Vi har en hel del klipp här som är profetiskt och jätteviktigt att lyssna till. Det är underbara sanningar som presenteras även om de är häpnadsväckande. Så bekräftar de avfallets tider. 73% av alla amerikanska kristna säger nämligen Bibeln inspirerar mig inte över synen om Israel. Och så frågar man då, vad inspirerar dig mest då? Media. Så här har vi alltså en generation som är uppvuxen och tar emot vad fake news media presenterar. Då kan jag säga er vänner att vi är framme vid andra Thessalonike brevet 2. För tror man på media mer än vad man tror på Bibeln då kan man ju inte älska sanningen speciellt mycket eftersom Bibeln presenterar sanningen. Och jag vill säga att världslig media förvrider sanningen. Och här får vi alltså välja vad vi vill tro på. I alla fall det kommer intressanta klipp och news flash i slutet. Gud välsigna er så hörs vi. Amen. Mark, thank you for joining me today. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. You do a great job on marking the end times uh, every Thursday when that comes out. You know, you're, you've just got such insight into, you know, really and truly, and I was telling somebody this the other day, you're, you're kind of the foremost uh, authority, I believe, or one of the foremost authorities in the world today on the end times. I'm not just puffing you up. Seriously. You're a, you're a scholar theologically, but you've written over 30 books on the end times. Yeah, and I had, a, you know, I, I had the privilege to study at Dallas Seminary, like with Dr. Walvert and Dr. Right. Pentecost. I got to know Dr. Ryrie. You know, that, that's what I owe it to, just some, some really great men that God let me have exposure to. Yeah. It really, uh, really helped me greatly in, in my study of prophecy. Well, you and I both enjoy, and I do enjoy, helping people to understand the times that we're living in. Uh, that's the purpose of endtimes.com. And the times we're living in are just off the charts, significant prophetically, the things that are happening. So we want to talk. We have some articles. We're going to answer some questions here in just a little bit. We're talking about Mystery Babylon the Great. Uh, we're going to be talking about that. Will we be here for the cashless society? We're going to talk about Wormwood, this uh, asteroid Apophis. And someone's asking if that's still significant. Uh, because it's going to be here in uh, 2029. So we're going to be talking about that in the question. Uh, let me begin with an article here. This is from Prophecy News Watch. Methodist Church goes full woke, warning that terms husband and wife are hurtful. And I'll read just a little bit of this article. It says, Franklin Graham, the popular evangelist who had, heads the Samaritan Purse Worldwide Christian Charity, as well as the Billy Graham Evangelist Evangelistic Association that his famous father started, is scolding officials of the Methodist Church in the United Kingdom. It is because they're telling ministers that using the words husband and wife is hurtful. The church's ideology comes from a worldwide agenda to promote the LGBT lifestyle choices. Mm -hmm. Those lifestyles made the use of those words awkward uh, because, for instance, when two men are married, which is the husband or both. Graham Online wrote, the Methodist Church in the United Kingdom has released its own inclusive church language guide that urges ministers and churchgoers to avoid using words such as husband and wife because those terms can be hurtful and offensive. He scolded, shame on the Methodist church. These are biblical terms. And marriage between a man and a woman is biblical truth. The word wife is used in some 360 verses in 38 books of the Bible. And let me leave one more paragraph here. He explained, they are in essence trying to edit what the Word of God says and, te and teaches to be more appealing to the changing whims of culture. We are warned against that in Scripture. As Christians, we aren't called to avoid what might offend people. We are called to share the truth of God's Word that can guide and direct us through every step of life. Well, first of all, I sure appreciate Franklin Graham. He's a, he's a great man. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the Methodist Church in the United Kingdom, I'm sure this is not all of the United Methodist Church, but a bunch of them, they're saying, don't say husband and wife. This is the church, Mark. This isn't you know some yeah. secular group. <laughs> And so what do you think about that? Well, you know, here here where I live in Oklahoma, and I know where you are there in Texas, you know, lots of churches are disaffiliating from United Methodists. It's been a huge crisis. Of course, some are disaffiliating to even become more liberal. 
some are disaffiliating because they don't like what's happening. And I, you know, I applaud those who are disaffiliating for uh, for that reason. But, you know, it's, it's an attack really on humanity. It's a satanic attack. Yeah. You know, all the way back in the beginning, God made them male and female. I mean, it's That's the right. core. We're, we're image bearers. We bear the image of God. That's right. And so this is a satanic attack that goes to the very heart of, of humanity. And, you know, the tragic irony of this is their, their, their uh, argument, you know, not using a husband and wife is self-evident that it's incorrect because in the Bible, it's over, over and over again. Every culture uses those words. Yeah. They have for, you know, in their own language, whatever those words are for, you know, for thousands and thousands of years. And so all of a sudden now, you know, we're, we're not going to use these terms. Even the terms male and female, when you get down to, to that is, you know, are being, uh, right. you know, being gotten rid of by many of these groups so it ultimately it's satan's attack on humanity who's made in god's image and it's apostasy you know we often think of apostasy in churches which is i think a major sign of the end people are going to get worse and worse deceiving and being deceived but the apostasy is is doctrinal but there's also moral apostasy and really the moral apostasy is just an outflow of this this doctrinal apostasy where they've you know denied God's word you know a lot of these uh, there, there's translations of the bible now where they get where they get rid of the masculine pronouns for god yeah. so it just i mean it even goes it goes to to humanity and male and female but it also goes to their, the very person of god himself well matthew 24 that's where jesus you know is talking to the disciples and he's giving the signs of the end times matthew 25 is when he tells two parables in a true story about the judgments when he returns. Well, the first parable is the parable of the 10 virgins. And the 10 virgins, I believe, represent the church. Um, five are wise, and they're walking in the light of the lamp. Five are foolish, and they don't have oil for their lamps. And the bridegroom, when he comes, he says, I never knew you, I didn't have a relationship with you. Hmm. Well, if you don't have a relationship with the Word of God, you don't have a relationship with God. You, you, can't, right. you can't have a relationship with Jesus and reject the Word of God. And so what they're doing is they're just simply saying, we're going to rewrite it based on what is, and, and by the way, the most liberal denominations are the dying denominations in America. Mm -hmm. And the growing, thriving, healthy churches are churches who stand on the Word of God, not, not in a mean way, not in a, a condemning way, but just simply in a militant way that just says we're not going to compromise the Word of God. And so you have an article there too, I believe, Mark. Yes, this is a really a, a st stunning article. I mean, it's not surprising, but um, here in the United States, uh, there's an article that I that I ran across in uh, the New York Post. It says a U.S. national debt swells to 34 trillion, exceeds combined GDP of several uh, other major nations. So again, this shouldn't be surprising. We've seen this just inching forward. But when you hear about these milestones like this, you know, we go to another a trillion, and you know, soon will be thirty-five a trillion dollars. Uh, the article says this is that the country's soaring national debt, which recently surpassed a record high of thirty-four trillion, is akin to a boiling frog for the economy and Wall Street investors. Like the frog in the, in the kettle that's just kind of there and is slowly, slowly being cooked and doesn't know it. Says uh, uh, Michael uh, Symbolist, who runs J.P. Morgan's Market and Investment Strategy Unit, predicted dire consequences for the economy if the Biden administration doesn't start tackling the debt. He wrote in a newsletter that the country cannot sustain higher deficits and ballooning net interest payments, which are soon expected to exceed the federal government's total revenue by early the next decade. The problem for the U.S. is the starting point. Every round of fiscal stimulus brings the U.S. one step closer to debt unsustainability. And so, therefore, they use this, this boiling frog analogy. But the, uh, the debt in the U.S. has now surpassed uh, many, many other nations, their GDP. Um, the debt has surpassed predictions by five years. It was predicted we'd be at, at uh, 34 trillion in 2029, but all the COVID and the stimulus yeah. and all of that. So this is one thing you don't want to be ahead of schedule in. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're ahead of schedule in this tragically. We, we've increased the, the, the debt in our country $3 trillion since June. Oh God! And the in, the interest payment here in America every day on the debt is two billion dollars of wow. interest uh, every day. So you know, there was an article years ago I read in Newsweek. It was called "How Empires Die," and the main point of the article was it's debt. Ultimately, debt. They they can't afford to to have an army and a navy, and of course today an air force. And so when I look at this, there's a couple of things I think that are very prophetically significant. I don't think America is mentioned in end time prophecy. Right. So I think it means something happens to us. 
Um, there, there are a lot of, you know, kind of doomsday scenarios out there today, but one of them is this massive increasing debt. And we know that in the tribulation period, that the third horseman, the black horse, that black rider is going to be a time of, of global uh, economic collapse. It'll be a coming economic Armageddon, a slowing. It, it's, a, it, it's a tragic failure on the part of our leaders and our government on both sides. Well, it's, it's, it's scary. It's, it's just another part of the, how fragile we are as a nation mm -hmm. and how little it would take to put us out. We're, we have the reserve currency of the world. The dollar is the strongest currency in the world because of confidence. When mm -hmm. other nations lose their confidence in our economy, that's the end. That's when you talk about when, when empires die. It's when yeah. people lose confidence in your ability to, to, uh, to perform on your, on, your, uh, on your obligations. So let me uh, <clears throat> read this article real quick. This says 73% of U.S. Christians say the Bible doesn't influence their views on Israel. And this is from Harbinger's Daily. It says only about a quarter of American Christians say the Bible influences their views on Israel as the Israel-Hamas war continues after the October 7th attack on civilians in southern Israel killed over 1,200 and prompted an Israeli military offensive in Gaza. Lifeway Research, in collaboration with the Philos Project, conducted a survey asking uh, 1,252 American Christians for their views on the Israel-Hamas war. The poll conducted between November 15th and 21st and released December 14th has a margin of error of 2.9 percentage points. Respondents were asked about what has influenced their views about Israel and were given a list of responses they could select and apply, and apply that. About 27% of Christians selected the Bible, suggesting that among 73% that among of respondents, the Bible does not inform their views on Israel. The Bible was the second most commonly cited answer coming in behind the media at 56 percent so christians this is this is conducted among christians mm. and they're saying well, how do you get your views on israel the media mm -hmm. over half of uh, you know, well you know if it was good media that would be good but in many, many cases it's very liberal media and listen if you like this how does the bible you know affect your view on this you know 73 percent say it doesn't the bible should affect our view on everything that's right <laughs> you know there, there should be nothing the bible doesn't affect our view on and you know certainly we we appreciate good good media and all that to give us good information but you know, it just highlights again the fact that the Bible is not being taught in churches. Yeah. You know, the, the word Israel occurs over 2,500 times in the Bible. Wow. Uh, the, word, the word Jerusalem, of course, it's the most mentioned city in the Bible, occurs over 800 times. Wow. So the Bible is just filled with Israel. And in the New Testament as well, there's, there's a lot about Israel in the New Testament. Yeah. I mean, the, the, very, the, the last two chapters of the Bible are about the New Jerusalem, yeah. uh, the, the heavenly city. And I think what the tragedy is, you know, people aren't being taught the Bible today. They're not being taught doctrine. And, of course, a part of that then is that they don't know anything about Israel. You go back and read the Bible. God made these eternal, um, it, unconditional covenants with the nation of Israel and with the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The, the covenant he made with Abraham, the covenant with David, uh, the new covenant in Jeremiah 31. So, you know, when people aren't taught the Bible and they don't know the Bible, they're going to go find their information other places. Right. And that's a scary thats a scary thought that Christians don't know how much the Bible says about Israel and don't use the Bible to guide them I mean, in their understanding of Israel. But, you know, that's part of what we, we try to do on these programs. That's and, right. and at endtimes.com is inform people you know, about, about the Bible and, and what the Bible does say about Israel. There, there was a book that came out years ago that became a movie. It was called The Da Vinci Code. It was mm -hmm. by Dan Brown. And the book was about the swoon theory. Uh, mm -hmm. Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. He just passed out. Eventually married Mary Magdalene. They had children, blah, blah, blah. And so based on that book, and this is, this is an article in the newspaper years ago, millions and millions of people in Europe and the United States and Canada rejected Christianity and mm -hmm. because of that book. 60 Minutes. I watched the special on 60 Minutes, Mark. They did a masterful job on 60 Minutes of completely taking apart all of the scholarship of that book and the claims mm -hmm. that it made. And so when you base your views on people and on media and on books and movies and things, and a lot of people do, it's shifting sand. It's going gonna, it's gonna to mm -hmm. constantly change. The thing I'm thankful for 
is when I was a young man, I got saved at 19, and we made a decision, Karen and I made a decision, we're basing our lives on the Bible. And 50 mm -hmm. years later, I'm thankful I made that decision because it's a solid Amen. foundation. You know, I was just going to mention one other thing. You know, both, both Harry Truman and Richard Nixon made important decisions they made in their presidencies. You know, Harry Truman acknowledged Israel 12, right. 11, 12 minutes after it was declared a nation. And that was because he was brought up in Missouri and his mother read him the Bible and he knew about Israel. And Richard Nixon helped Golda Meir and, and, and the Yom Kippur War 1973 because his mother had actually told him, one of these days in your life, you're going to be able to help the Jewish people and you need to do that. Wow. So he grew up, grew up in a family where they knew the Bible. So, you know, thankfully we had presidents who knew the Bible and yeah. knew what the Bible said about Israel that helped Israel at very important times in their modern history. You know, I think God in his providence had those men there at those times. Well, you and I are both pastors and preachers, and we would sure encourage any pastor out there, talk about Israel, talk about mm, how important sure. they are, and talk about the end times. Help your people understand the times we're living in. So you have a, a article here on the Persian-Russian connection. Right. You know, one of the things that's been tra it's tragic about the war, the, the Russia-Ukraine war, which is just grinding on, you know, 90% of the, of the pre-war troops that they had in Russia are, are, are either killed or, uh, or, or uh, wounded, wow. injured. Wow. 90 percent of them. They're saying that this article I, I've, I've got here from Yahoo News says Russia is on course to lose 500,000 troops by the end of 2024 oh, after wow. turning its forces into a low quality, high quantity mass army. So the, the, the quality of their army is just decreasing. Now, it's not 500,000 killed, but the 500,000 killed and wounded that, that, are, that are out of action. The article says Russia is on course to lose 500,000 troops in Ukraine. Uh, the department said Russia's force has become a, a low quality, high quantity mass army. It's, it said it would most likely take Russia five to 10 years to rebuild its forces uh, to a high standard. So they're just being decimated. And that's just a, a human tragedy. You know, yeah. we, you know, we, we live in relative safety. Think about you know, that many lives being, being injured and, and being killed in that way. And so it's a, you know, there's about 300 a day right now uh, Russian troops being, being maimed, being, being killed. And, you know, this is having a, a, a tragic effect on, on Russia's army. And one of the things I see about this that, that really I think could be very prophetically significant, Russia right now is a wounded bear. Yes, they are. We all know that a wounded bear is a dangerous bear. And I think this is forcing their hand right now to become more and more dependent on Iran. In fact, in, in an article that, that uh, you, you just mentioned there, the Russian-Persian connection, it, it, it highlights in this article that there's a, a deeper reliance that Russia has on Iran and that, that it's deepening. They're, they're getting drones from Iran. They're yeah. getting oil from Iran, obviously, because they have a lot of sanctions on them. They're also purchasing Iranian ballistic missiles. And... You know, we often wonder, you know, what, what will bring Russia into the Gog-Magog war against Israel? You know, Russia, they, they kind of go back and forth on their, their, their support or lack thereof of Israel. The Gaza wars deepen their, their, their animosity to Israel. But as Russia becomes more dependent on Iran, and Iran obviously hates Israel you right. know, with a passion, that could be what draws Russia uh, into this. I believe a weakened Russia uh, could also... Um, could uh, could also uh, be mean they're going to help Iran more with Iran's nuclear ambitions. Yes, you know, Iran could make demands on Russia to help them more with that. So it's a it's kind of a really combustible situation there. I think that that's taking place, and so um, you know Russia is sending more and more low quality troops, and just kind of there, there's a tactic they're using just called the human wave. It is sending waves of troops that are being killed. And so, you know, I really see this as Russia and Iran are deepening their ties. And especially as Russia becomes more dependent on Iran, they're going to be more inclined to follow what Iran wants to do. And that could be even hooks and jaws that drags Russia into this uh, to, to support Iran uh, because of their, their weakened condition. I wonder how long it can be, Mark. And, and this again comes from Prophecy News Watch. And this is concerning the great North American eclipse. And I think a lot of people will remember in 2017, there was a, an eclipse that went, I believe it's from Oregon to South Carolina, all the way across the United States. Well, here in just a few months, on April the 8th, there's another eclipse that's coming up. It'll come from Texas up through Maine, go all the way across the United States. Uh, it'll be visible, uh, it, it will be experienced by 30 million Americans. Literally, it'll just go over 
where you're living and you'll, you'll experience the darkness. So the question is, has it happened before? And the answer is yes. The, the path of a solar eclipse that occurred on June 16th, 1806, combined with the path of a solar eclipse that occurred on September 17th, 1811, also formed a giant X over the New Madrid Fault region, now the New, New Madrid Fault. So in the central United States, Mississippi Valley, uh, this is like Illinois, Missouri, uh, you know, Tennessee, Kentucky, that area there. This is the New Madrid Fault. It's a massive fault system. Mm -hmm. So the question is, has this ever happened before? Yes, it happened before in the early 19th century. Okay, three months after the solar eclipse that happened on September 17, 1811, a series of absolutely enormous earthquakes began to happen on the New Madrid Fault. The New Madrid earthquakes were the biggest earthquakes in American history. They occurred in the central Mississippi Valley, but were felt as far away as New York City, Boston, Montreal, and Washington, D.C. President James Madison and his wife Dolly felt them in the White House. Church bells rang in Boston. From December 16, 1811 through March of 1812, there were over 2,000 earthquakes in the central Midwest and between 6,000 to 10,000 earthquakes in the Booth Hill of Missouri, where the New Madrid, uh, New, New Madrid is located near the junction of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. In the known history of the world, no other earthquakes have lasted so long or produced so much evidence of damage as the New Madrid earthquakes. Three of the earthquakes are on the list of America's top earthquakes. The first one on December 16, 1811, a magnitude of 8.1 on the Richter scale. The second on January 23, 1812, at 7.8. And the third on February 7, 1812, uh, as much as 8.8 .8 magnitude. Now those are massive earthquakes. Oh, yeah. So right when, three months before those earthquakes, there was an X. Over the same basic region, this is about to happen. I'm not predicting anything, and I pray to God that nothing like that happens. Oh, yeah. But the Jews, Jesus said there'll be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. Genesis yeah. 1 says God created the sun, moon, and stars for signs and for seasons. And so Jesus, when he was born, the Magi went to found him because of the star that was in the sky. So God uses the sky to communicate. Well, it is believed by the Jews that a lunar eclipse is an omen to the Jewish people. But a sol solar eclipse is an omen to the world. So here we have two solar eclipses creating an X, marking an X over America. And the question is, what could it mean? Well, I just want to just, I want to get your comments on it, but I want to say Bill Koenig is a, a frequent guest here on the show. And he wrote that book, Eye to Eye, which talks about the mm -hmm. consequences of dividing the nation of Israel. Well, we have divided Israel. With the United States, the Gaza issue that we're in right now, we caused it. America, under the George W. Bush administration, we forced Israel out of the Gaza Strip. And then the, the Palestinians moved in, Hamas took over, and the rest is history. So we are now, the Biden administration, I so much appreciate the military support they've given Israel, but the Biden administration is pressuring Israel to give up, well, to enter into a two-state solution, to give back Gaza and to give up East Jerusalem and the West Bank. And so my, my question is, so... When Hurricane Katrina happened, it was five days after we forced Israel out of the Gaza Strip. And Bill mm -hmm. Koenig, in his book, I think it's 126 documented examples of when the United States was trying to force Israel to give up land and natural disasters, historic natural disasters that happened. So this X, the Great American Earthquakes, April 8th, that's coming up here in a few months, we're going to have another uh, a really unprecedented solar eclipse in my lifetime that we're going to see this X that's formed over the New Madrid uh, area of the United States. And so, again, I pray nothing happens. But, but I just want to say this to say it is happening, and it's a big deal. The, this, the, the, two, the Great American uh, Eclipses, it is a big deal, and I believe that God is saying something. If it's not you know, earthquakes, maybe it's repentance or something. But what do you think about it? Well, it's interesting you mentioned all those earthquakes that were measured then. Think about that, too. That was back in the early 1800s when they couldn't measure them like they can now. There are probably a lot more. Yeah. You know, we have so much more sophisticated equipment now. Um, yeah, Secretary Blinken, Anthony Blinken, yeah, I just heard yesterday on, on the news, he was over, he's stopped in Turkey first. He's making kind of a mid tour. It was all about the two-state solution. 
Yeah. Um, it's all about these two states, which again, we had, there was a two state solution in 1947 yeah. uh, that, that was not accepted by the Arabs. It was accepted by the Jewish people. There'd been at the Oslo Accords, there was other offers of that. So uh, that, that's, that, that's what they, that's what they want. That's what the government wants. That's what these other nations all want. That's what's being, being, being put forward. And uh, again, like you said, we don't know when, when these things are going to happen, what's going to happen, but uh, God consistently does speak to the world through, through the heavens. And it does create a sense of dread as well with people these kind of events they're, they're ominous yeah and and again like you i hope nothing like that happens but we look at our country today and all the other things that are happening not only how we treat israel but just all the other things that are happening in our country yeah. um you know it, i i hope it will bring about a repentance you know in our in our nation the, all, all these events taking place we, we need it desperately well back in the 1800s when those earthquakes happened you know that was a very uh, sparsely populated area Mm -hmm. The articles yeah. that I read don't even talk about how many people died because they don't know. Mm -hmm. Today, right. it, would, it would be devastation. If you had, oh. you, first of all, it would snap every bridge up and down the Mississippi. And mm -hmm. by the way, the earthquake was so severe in 1811 that the Mississippi flowed backwards for several hours. So it, right. yeah. it literally changed the course of the Mississippi River. So mm -hmm. today, that would snap every bridge, stop truck mm -hmm. traffic, car traffic, you know, east to west. So anyway... I don't know, don't know what it means, but it's happening, and I just wanted to talk about it. And also, I thought it was fascinating that it's happened before, and when it did mm -hmm. happen before, there were very severe, uh, you know, ramifications. We neglected the principle of support, which is al-jihad fi sabilillah. The only way that can stop is to face the enemy the way they face us. They face us with aggression. We should retaliate with aggression. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا Fight! In a path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who fight against you, they will fight, they will defend the deen, they will defend their land, not with their tongues, but with their blood. And each one of us should be a soldier today. So I, you know jihad, they will try everything, but it's only jihad, only jihad that can bring victory. Not contracts, not agreements, not allyism, not all these things. Only thing, wallahi. That can bring Izzah to this Ummah is Al Jihadu, Alladi Taraddada Kalamu Fi Kitabillah, or Fi Ahadithi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The only thing that can bring Izzah, honor, and glory to this nation is Jihad. Hani and Lihwanina, Fi Gaza, Abtal, Wallahi, they are warriors. Abtal, they are warriors. They are men. Just like the Sahaba, لا يخافون الموت ولا يهابونه. يا يهود الذل المجرم الظالم المفسد كفو كلكم حتما سيقتل. The Yahud, the aggressor, the evil. You describe them, what they do. والله الذي لا إله إلا هو. All of them will be killed by Muslims. They all will be executed by Muslims. كلهم سيقتلون لأنه وعد إلهي ولا بد أن يقع. This a promise from Allah سبحانه وتعالى and it's gonna happen. كلهم سيقتلون. كلهم سيقتلون ويوم إذن يفرح المؤمنون بنصر الله.
The applicant has regrettably put before the court <coughs> a profoundly distorted factual and legal picture. The entirety of its case hinges on a deliberately curated, decontextualised and manipulative description of the reality of current hostilities. South Africa purports to come to this court in the lofty position of a guardian of the interest of humanity. But in delegitimizing Israel's 75-year existence in its opening presentation yesterday, that broad commitment to humanity rang hollow.